Welcome everyone to Africam for Good, brought to you by explore.org. Today we're going to be talking all things reptile with Chris Cook, the owner and director of the Footspread Reptile Centre. Welcome, Chris. Good to have you with us. Thanks, James. Yeah, it's good to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and where you are and how you do it. So, uh, as you said, I'm the, the, the owner and the director of Hoodspread Reptile Centre, uh, at least the current one. Uh, you know, the centre is 38 years old uh, this year. And uh, one day when I'm an old man, I'm going to be passing the reins on to somebody else. And that's really important because there always needs to be a little reptile centre in Hoodspread doing the good work uh, that we do. Uh, but uh, I've had a history uh, and, and a career very luckily um, in reptiles uh, ever since I left school. Uh, you know, very few people manage to find themselves doing something that they absolutely love and I was one of those few individuals that I can say that that, that happened um, you know from a whole bunch of uh, lucky reasons I guess uh, but the whole point of uh, the reptile center and what we do is to help uh, protect and conserve reptiles because let's be honest uh, they're not uh, considered terribly cuddly for the most part and uh, reptiles are generally overshadowed by uh, the bigger more charismatic megafauna so you know we need to speak up for them so that we can do things for them. Just quickly tell me, whereabouts in Hoodspread are you? So if you're familiar with the town, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a tiny little town. We don't even have uh, traffic lights, but, you know, there's a handful of stop streets. We're about uh, 12 or 13 kilometers outside of Hoodspread town towards the mountain, so towards the Drakensberg side. Um. Tell us a little bit about the work that the Reptile Centre does. Are you doing rescues? Are you involved in a lot of conservation work? What's your kind of main day-to-day -day stuff? So that's um, that's an easy question to answer. Uh, it's also a very long answer, but <laughs> I'll try to keep it uh, uh, short and direct. Um, so essentially, we are a reptile zoo, uh, but we're so much more than just a zoo. We are a center for conservation of reptiles. Uh, as I said, we've been, yeah, you can come and visit the center, uh, pay the admission fee, and look at the animals on display. But there's so much that happens behind the scenes, uh, which we try our best to, to bring to the public attention so that people can understand what we do. Um, but uh, yeah, you could come and visit the animals uh, just as a, as a tourism perspective. But really, what we try and do is uh, live by our ethos, which is conservation through education and research. And uh, because we don't buy animals, we don't sell animals, we don't trade in animals, and we do uh, everything we can to uh, limit the breeding of the animals at the center, uh, we're not making money or focusing on anything that has anything to do with trade. How the center runs and operates is by selling education. That's our product. Um, now, in that, we have a whole lot of different educational programs. I mean, you can come to HIC and you can learn how to capture snakes. You can come to the facility and learn all about veterinary uh, medicine. Uh, we have an on-site uh, reptile vet as our team as well. Uh, you can also come and learn about how to take care of reptiles in captivity if you want to be a zookeeper one day. Uh, you know, apart from that, we also see a lot of uh, um, schools that come and visit the area. So we do a lot of school education work. We even even have a photographic safari uh, you know so if you're a keen photographer and you wanted uh, a perfect picture of a cobra standing up and spitting venom it's very easy for us to set that up and do for you uh, you know so we do a huge variety of um, of different educational uh, programs whatever we can think of that can help spread the word of conservation and uh, create an interest in reptiles then uh, that's what we uh, do so we also have a captive breeding program. Uh, remember that we uh, took the center over in December of uh, 2019. And in South Africa, as you know, um, we went into hard lockdown in March. So that means as the new owners, we only had a handful of months of business and then we were actually closed for eight months. Um, and that has caused a huge delay in, in our conservation uh, uh, goals. That said, uh, we really are doing very well in achieving those goals given the terrible funding that we have at the moment. Um, and part of that is our captive breeding programs. These programs, the center has never taken part in in the past, uh, but you know, we really believe that to properly conserve animals, we need to work with other people. Uh, you know, you can't act as an independent institute and try and save the world's problems. And we love collaborating. So through our collaborations, um, we have identified four captive breeding programs, which we'd like to take part in. Uh, we don't have any of the animals yet at the center and these 
collaborations take quite some time to to sort of set up but we are involved in a, a conservation uh, program a captive breeding program for the sun gazer lizard uh, for the durban dwarf burrowing skink for the albany adder and the picker skills reed frog so whilst these animals are not strictly endangered you know we also shouldn't be waiting um until they are endangered before we start actually creating conservation programs uh, so some of them are more threatened or more endangered than others but these are the projects that we've identified and we can't wait to get started with the actual breeding of these animals and of course remember the breeding the, the sole purpose and goal of these projects is to learn how to keep the animals in captivity and to uh, create these husbandry manuals that uh, need to be uh, created so that in the event of an ecological disaster or catastrophe and we have to pull animals from the wild and repopulate them in a zoo environment we can actually do that and we have the experience to to do something uh, along those lines. So, so what, I, what I'd like to talk next about is our, is our um, snake rescue service or reptile uh, relocation service. Uh, and this is another thing that the center does. So in our area, uh, should anyone have an, an issue with an animal which is unwanted, mostly it's snakes, but it can also be lizards or even a crocodile from time to time, uh, then they can reach out to the center and for free, we'll come and help them. Uh, we don't charge for our, our, our call outs. Um, we find that over the years, you know, if you do charge, uh, particularly as an institution, uh, people will say, well, I'm not paying that 100 Rand uh, for you to remove the snake, I'd rather just kill it. So it discourages people from uh, calling us. But we capture and relocate hundreds of snakes every single year. And it's an important part of what we do. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all available uh, all the time uh, for it. Uh, then the final thing that the center does, uh, and very important is uh, community engagement and community awareness. So Hoodspate is located uh, in, in uh, the, the Lofalt, um, in quite a rural part of the country. And there's lots and lots of communities in the surrounding areas scattered amongst farms and uh, you know game farms citrus farms things like that um, and they're generally quite populated areas and not everyone has the financial capacity to come to a center like ours and to look at the animals on display. Um, so we feel very strongly that we uh, need to get into our uh, local communities and teach people about snakes. So this is a, a project that we created uh, early last year. It's called CCAP, it stands for Snake Education and Community Awareness, um, and it's a partnership between Hoodspread Reptile Center and Save the Snakes, which is an American nonprofit organization. Um, and this is such a cool um, uh, project, and I can speak more about it later if you like, but essentially the goals are to get into local communities and train people teach people about reptile conservation, and we do this all for free. Uh, you know, so if you're a rural school and your classroom is literally a tree with a handful of chairs and tables underneath it, you also need conservation education. And uh, we get to those schools. In fact, we did a presentation just yesterday um, on exactly this kind of thing. How far afield do you go for that stuff? I mean, I know Good Sprite is surrounded by rural communities. How far, what sort of radius are you operating? So our CCAP project has only really been running for about a year and a half. And obviously we had major, major setbacks with COVID yeah. and things. Um, and uh, we have a, a number of different partners that assist us with it. Um, one of our partners is an organization called Global Conservation Corps. Um, and they actually have set schools which they work with uh, right as far as uh, Kruger National Park, um, you know, so uh, right into the outlining areas. And the truth is, we don't mind traveling an hour and a half to get to a school that needs our help. Um, and, you know, we, we go wherever the, the need is. Uh, but it really is focused on our immediate surrounding areas. Um, so that would be Akronook and Bushpark Ridge, uh, the Willows, the Oaks, all of these small communities around us. Uh, but if we need to go somewhere else and, and we have the capacity to do that, then we're happy to do so. Tell us a little bit about the reptiles that you have in the center at the moment. So we have quite an old collection. Um, I used to actually work at the at the reptile center over a decade ago before we uh, took it on yeah. as, as the owners. Um, so I have a very strong love and attachment for this place. Um, and I can say of all the places that I've worked at, nobody does more conservation education than, than this tiny little reptile park in the middle of the low felt. Um, and I, I work now today with many of the same individual snakes and lizards as I did over a decade ago. So um, it's a testament to the care of the animals that have uh, that we have here. Uh, but a lot of our animals are, are super old and, uh, you know, we'll be looking to replace them in the near future, eventually when they do die of old age. Uh, that said, we have a balance of uh, snakes, uh, predominantly snakes. In fact, we have a balance of lizards. We've got 
crocodiles, we've got an alligator, we've got some turtle species as well, uh, some terrapins, which are quite similar. Uh, and then we also have a selection of arachnids, so spiders and scorpions, uh, some insects as well, like cockroaches. Uh, and we, we really kind of gravitate as an organization towards the animals that people generally don't like. Uh, you know, people often uh, are fearful of animals that have too many legs or not enough legs, you know, it's quite strange. Um, yeah. But it really is a balance of uh, all the different groups of reptiles uh, uh, that exist. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a very old collection. And if somebody wanted to come through there and wanted to see venomous snakes, what could they expect to see? So at the moment, I would say we have a 50% indigenous collection and 50% exotic. Um, as mm -hmm. part of our uh, ongoing collection plan, uh, we would like to shift towards uh, an 80 to 85% Southern African uh, species. Um, and uh, that will be a, 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 a slow progress uh, um, that we will uh, you know, try to, to do as quick as possible, I guess. But if you came through and you wanted to look at snakes, we've got boom slung, we've got black mambas, we've got gaboon vipers, puff adders, runkles, spitting cobras, snouting cobras. We have the majority of the um, sort of the, the really toxic snakes that you might find. And then we also have a lot of harmless species because those are also important to show people uh, the benefit of having. So we have an egg eater, we've got a brown house snake, yeah, we've got mole snakes. It really is a well-represented uh, collection within um, you know, what you might find in South Africa. And then if you like the charismatic exa examples from overseas, you can meet Ali, our alligator. We have anacondas as well, which is a, a, a very uh, charismatic species, uh, you know, pythons from Indonesia. So there's, there's really, there's a little bit for everybody. And you say these, you know, a lot of the animals you're working with have been there for more than a decade. What's the longest living reptile you have there? It's a tricky question because you know, it's, it's very difficult to accurately assess how old the snake is. Uh, when we took over the center, uh, sadly, there wasn't a, a lot of um, uh, reliable records in place. Um, it's one of the things that we changed immediately when we took over. Um, but uh, I can say our black mambas on display are very, very old. Um, when I first started at the center, uh, I was told that at that point, they were around 20 years old. And that was, you know, over 10 years ago. So I would say our black mambas are probably one of the oldest the snakes we have there they're around 30 maybe even 35 and um, there's a couple of other animals that are just as old and um, how I know that is because particularly with our black members they were part of a research project um, yeah. and as such uh, has have uh, have special scarring or uh, scarring on their bodies which um, at the time people put these telemetry devices inside to track and locate them and, and those scars on those individual animals are absolutely diagnostic and they're the exact same snakes uh, that I used to work with so um, yeah, but, um, you know, there are older animals in zoo collections. Um, there's a green anaconda in Johannesburg, which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, currently the oldest green anaconda female in captivity in the world, and she's about 46 or 47 years. Uh, and, you know, here's the thing. In, in captivity, animals do get a lot older. They don't have natural predators, but they're also at the full mercy of the expertise of the people that yeah. care for them. You know? So if we don't mm. uh, get the diets right or the enclosures right, then something might happen. You know, then, yeah. then, then an animal could live a lot less. But in the wild, <clears throat> we actually have no idea how old snakes get. It's yeah. not an animal like a an elephant or a rhino, it's born on one day, you can follow it its entire life uh, and you know when it dies. You know, snakes are too secretive, uh, too quick to escape and uh, it's very difficult to try to yeah. guess how old they, they might get in the wild. Do you have a favorite at the center? People, people always ask us that, you know, what's your favorite snake, your favorite lizard? Um, and, I, and I guess people want to know, you know, if, if the snake guys have a favorite, then that must be a really interesting animal. Um, the truth is I don't really have a favorite. I, I do gravitate towards uh, snakes over the other groups of reptiles. Uh, but really, if I had to really decide, it would have to be somewhere between a boom slung and a gaboon viper. Um, you know, boom slung are highly, highly toxic snakes, but very docile, beautiful snakes to look at. Uh, and and if you look at the gaboon viper, it's a, the, probably the one of the most beautiful patterned snakes in the whole world. Also highly toxic. It has the longest fangs out of any snake in the world, yet in, in also incredibly docile. Uh, so I think those would probably be my, my two top, top uh, contenders, but it's so difficult to really say. Cool. Um, are you dealing with anything? I mean, you mentioned those four animals that you're going to be uh, breeding. Are there any other endangered species that you're currently looking after? 
So the, the animals that we've identified, um, uh, as I said, are not um, all endangered. Some are um, endangered, some are threatened. Uh, and because we don't physically have any of those animals at the center at the moment, we're not really doing a work deliberately uh, or focused entirely on those animals. But remember, um, we, we uh, have a broad spectrum conservation message and goal, and that encompasses uh, animals that are vulnerable, that are uh, of least concern, and the ones that are endangered. Um, and, uh, you know, we really are looking forward to getting stuck in with those captive breeding programs when we can. What do you think some of the biggest misconceptions people have about snakes are? I think one of the, the most long-standing misconceptions are that snakes are evil. Uh, snakes mm. are uh, vindictive and they hate people and they want to try and attack and bite you. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, humanity has created this conception uh, on snakes uh, for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, you know, a lot of uh, religions are very tightly intertwined with snakes. Uh, some religions see snakes as evil, whilst other religions actually uh, see snakes as, as, a, as a holy animal, you know. So it really depends on your culture and the environment that uh, you grow up in. Now, one thing that is um, the, 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 the unfortunate truth is that there are some snakes out there that are potentially deadly to people. And because of that, people have developed this fear on snakes. And much of what people think they know is uh, false. And it is, um, it is made worse by uh, social media. It is made worse by television programs and movies. And, you know, years and years ago, it was very easy for us to pick out um, the rubbish on the internet because, you know, the graphics would be terrible. But now everyone's an expert in Photoshop, you know. Um, and people create fake news and fake content and it spreads so fast. You know, the unfortunate thing is that misinformation spreads faster than fact. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions, snakes are not out to catch and kill people. They actually are incredibly important for the environment and all they ever want from people is just to be left alone. So snakes are not the animals that yeah. people think they are. So what would your main message to be to people be about snakes in general? Or, I mean, even um, reptiles, you know, I mean, let's, let's go snakes first and then reptiles in general, because as you say, you know, unless they're charismatic mammals, people tend to ignore them. So, so I think the message is exactly that, you know, um, reptiles are in desperate need of the world's attention and the world's focus. They are overshadowed by the, the charismatic megafauna, particularly uh, birds and mammals, which have a lot more emotion and people can make a connection with those animals a lot easier. Uh, but the truth is reptiles are an incredibly fascinating, unique group of animals and they need the world's attention, um, you know, possibly more than, than many other uh, kinds of uh, animals that currently receive it um, and you know the take-home message is that uh, reptiles are not out there to scare and attack and bite people and they form an intricate part of our ecosystem and that is one of the reasons why you find snakes for example on almost every continent on the planet you know if you take snakes out of the ecological equation um, much of the ecosystem is at risk of collapsing so we really do need to protect snakes uh, as all other animals of course uh, but we need to bring uh, the uh, conservation message to the public eye um, and that's an important part of what we do here. Okay. I wanted to ask you something now about something we've been witnessing on our African cameras over the last week or so. And there's an African rock python in Baluli that has, it's, it's operating nocturnally and it comes out onto a, a log during the course of the evening and it just lies there or the early morning. And but it lies there in plain view. So it's not ambushing from the leaf litter or anything like that. Mm. And twice now we've watched birds land on a branch next to it, obviously oblivious and get nailed. Once a, a little pytelia, and then we think from what we can tell a spotted eagle owl, is this something that's relatively common? Don't they normally come out of the leaf litter? So uh, Southern African pythons are ambush hunters by nature. Um, they are mostly active at uh, night. Um, but then again, if you're an ambush hunter, you can't really afford to be picky and choose when you want to hunt and when you don't. And essentially, you're going to find a concealed spot where your own camouflage is really working. Um, and it's important for an ambush hunter to have good camouflage for two reasons. One, to avoid predation. So you need to hide from your predators, but you also need to hide from your prey. Um, and in the cases on your video, and, and I was quite surprised 
eyes to see them. It's a really cool little clip as well. Um, it's, as you say, the snake is seemingly uh, spread right out on this branch. I don't think particularly in ambush mode, uh, but it's still opportunistic. Now, um, I would suspect that um, uh, the snake was basking either to get early rays uh, in the morning or the last little bit of uh, heat before the evening sets in. And as the bird lands on the branch, it would have stimulated the, sneak, the, the snake's heat censoring uh, pits. And uh, immediately that uh, uh, instinctive brain triggers into food mode. And you saw how quickly that snake responded and reacted. And this is very important because if you're slow and you're an ambush hunter and you miss your meal, that might be the last meal you get for a week or month or maybe even uh, six months. You know, So it's remarkable footage. It's very, very interesting. And generally what we find with ambush hunters, just like the pythons, is that they're non-selective. You know, you can't be picky. So whether it's a tiny little bird or a uh, bird or an eagle, uh, owl, as you said, um, you know, you, you've got to grab onto it, you've got to catch that meal. And the advantage that pythons have is that they're generally big snakes with massive gapes and they can really swallow ginormous animals. Uh, what's the difference between a Southern African python and an African rock python? Um, essentially, they, they uh, two different species. Um, the Southern African python is the one that we find in Southern African uh, countries. It's, uh, it's python natalensis. And generally, the African rock python is a Central African snake, uh, python sabay. So it, it is on a species level. They look very, very similar. Um, and um, the, the English uh, common names often get muddled up and mixed up. And scientists uh, do change these things from time to time. And for the longest time, uh, everyone used to refer to the pythons as African rock pythons. But technically, it's more accurate nowadays to say the Southern African python or the Central African python. Um, what's the highlight for you of the work that you do? I imagine, like with most people in conservation, you aren't planning on buying a yacht on the Mediterranean anytime soon <laughs> with, the, with the proceeds of your business. What's the kind of, what's, why do you do what you do? What's, what's the highlight for you? I would say the highlight most definitely is um, when we chat a lot to public, or when we go to these uh, rural schools, for example, because, it, because education is our focus, when you engage with somebody who's really scared of snakes, people are, uh, they have tunnel vision. They don't want to listen to what you're saying. They don't want to understand that this animal perhaps has a different side. Uh, but very slowly, um, you know, with the right information and with education being key, you can actually change somebody's perception. And that gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure. Uh, you know, you speak to somebody and in the beginning they hate snakes but at the end of the conversation or the end of your tour the end of your program they actually have an appreciation for these animals um, and i think that's what uh, fuels us to get up in the morning and do what we do you know we need organizations like ourselves and other organizations out there throughout the world uh, to to educate people because without it, uh, these animals just don't stand a chance. Um, and if you speak to any of the, the people that work here at the center and work in reptile conservation in general, it's tough. It's not an easy job. And it's most definitely not an industry that's going to make you a lot of money. And um, the reason why we operate as a business as such is because we don't get uh, international funding. Uh, we don't get sponsorship from the governments or big donations. Um, you know, that all goes to the more charismatic animals. So we have have to create our own revenue so that we can cycle that back into conservation. And that's again why we have come up with as many varieties of educational programs as we can think of so that we can create the revenue that we need to run the center and also to support our captive breeding programs, our snake rescue service, our CCAP initiative. Uh, it's really, really important. If we don't create that funding and we were a nonprofit organization, uh, we wouldn't be nearly as effective as uh, what we are today. So, so CCAP is our community awareness program. Um, it stands for Snake Education and Community Awareness Program, in fact. And it's a project that is jointly funded by Hood Spade Reptile Center and Save the Snakes in America. Um, this is a huge ambitious project. We created the project uh, about a year and a half ago. We've been massively delayed um, by, uh, of course, COVID and the challenges that come uh, as a result. Uh, but CCAP has many different cogs working together as a conservation program. So um, I'll take you through them very briefly. One of the most important aspects is education for school kids. Uh, we visit a lot of schools in our local communities for free, and we teach people all about snakes and snake safety. But we go above and beyond 
beyond that, we also visit our local clinics and hospitals and we gauge with nurses and doctors to formulate the best possible plan when it, teach, uh, when it comes to treating snake bites in our area. We want to make sure that everybody is on the same page and that we work with uh, medical professionals to make sure that we have the best possible way of actually treating snake bites. Uh, we've also created an anti-venom bank at Hoodsprade Reptile Center. This is very important. The center's never had one, uh, but we now have a very well-stocked anti-venom bank and uh, we will make that available to people if they need it. Uh, so of course, we are not doctors. You can't come to the snake park if you're bitten by a snake, but we can meet you at the hospital if there is no anti-venom and make use of the ones that uh, we have uh, here. Uh, we also then train community members in snake removal. Um, and this is because most people, when they find a snake, they kill a snake because they're scared of it. And we can't always get to every single snake emergency. So we train uh, our identified individuals in communities to uh, safely capture and relocate problem animals so that there's no need for people to feel that they have to try and uh, kill them. Uh, and then, of course, um, all of this, all of these cogs uh, work together simultaneously um, uh, to, uh, you know, to produce our main conservation uh, goals. Uh, so it's a huge ambitious uh, project. Um, we're, we're really happy to that the wheels are turning, but we desperately do need funding um, so that we can keep doing uh, the good work that we do. One question that everybody's going to want to be asking, uh, have you ever been bitten? <laughs> That's, that's always such an, uh, um, a popular question. So the truth is, yes, uh, most people that work with animals have been bitten by animals. If you ask your vet, have they been bitten by a dog? Uh, they probably have, or they've been scratched by a cat or bitten by a bird. Um, working with the animals that uh, we work with does come with risks. And uh, if the risks are very low, um, then, you know, we're more relaxed around the animals. For example, if I was to uh, pick up or work with a completely harmless snake, I'll probably pick it up with my hands there's no need to use specialized snake equipment and if i had just been cleaning the rats and mice and perhaps i smelled like food then perhaps i could get bitten by um very luckily up until this point in my career i haven't been bitten by a dangerously venomous snake um, and that is because when we work with seriously venomous animals uh, we up the level entirely and you know we take safety very very seriously so we don't uh, promote uh, ridiculous snake shows where, where people um, harass the snakes and pin them and expose their fangs and do all these crazy crazy things. Um, you know, when we do our uh, tours and presentations, we really want the focus to be on the animal and not on the person presenting uh, that snake to people. Uh, so touch wood, haven't been bitten yet. Uh, it's entirely possible to go your entire career without a snake bite. Um, and uh, I really hope uh, I'm able to, to achieve that. Do you play any role at all with milking snakes for anti-venoms and that sort of thing? Is that still happen or, you know, has so, the fashion of treating snake bites um, symptomatically sort of taken over and negated the need for anti-venom? Uh, in fact, it's the, the opposite. Um, in 2017, the World Health Organization declared snake bite as a neglected tropical disease. Um, and it's very difficult to get accurate statistics, but there's almost 3 million snake bites a year uh, worldwide. And that's a phenomenal number. And now, of course, the death uh, rates are, are a lot uh, lower than that. Um, and not all snake bites were re recorded or reported. So it's, it's a very tricky sort of subject. But um, in, in actual fact, the trend of treating snake bites symptomatically is only really useful if um, it's not life-threatening. Um, when, it, when it is life-threatening, absolutely anti-venom is the only thing that can uh, uh, resolve a, a dangerous snake bite. Uh, in South Africa, we have a very good anti-venom. It's world-class. In fact, it's so good, it's remained largely unchanged for years and years, and um, other countries actually copy what we do. Unfortunately, the amount of snake bite antivenom that is produced every single year is actually quite low. Um, so I'm standing under correction here, but we, we, we produce around 15,000 vials of snake bite antivenom. And that's not a lot considering um, many uh, sub, uh, Southern African countries actually use our antivenom in treatment for snake bites. So there needs to be a lot more. And because of that, um, the milking of snakes to produce antivenom is critical. It's a necessary evil. Uh, 
you know, there is a, a level of stress that the snakes go uh, in order to extract the antivenom, um, but it's the only thing that really helps. So uh, to come back to your question, do we milk snakes? No, not at this point, um, but we are going to start the construction of a venom extraction lab, uh, hopefully later this year. And we will then be contributing uh, to supplying the vaccine producers with that life-saving venom, which is used to make uh, antivenom. And we, we have decided to participate in this as part of a social responsibility. You know, we have the expertise, we have the facilities for the most part, um, and we have the animals. So we should be supplying uh, venom so that we can, uh, you know, uh, do our best to alleviate the burden of this constant shortage of antivenom. If anybody wanted to get involved with the Hoodspread Reptile Center or help out, what would you say to them? Uh, so, yes, absolutely. We, we love uh, the support of the public. In fact, the, the center uh, uh, relies on it. And there's lots of different ways that somebody can help. You can help just by uh, visiting the center, paying the entry fee. That money goes into the conservation of the, the, the animals anyway. Um, you can uh, make a physical donation in terms of, of money. Uh, you can make a donation in terms of material, bags of cement to build new enclosures or uh, plumbing supplies to fix the, up the, the plumbing or the business uh, buildings or something like that. Um, so so there's many ways that you can get involved. I think the, one of the most, um, uh, one of the best ways you can get involved is by utilizing our educational programs. Um, so if you're in the area, choose Hoodspray Reptile Center for your snake capture course training, choose Hoodspray Reptile Center for your snake uh, awareness training, your snake bite first aid training, your photographic uh, safaris, uh, and utilize us. We're, we're, we're an institution within the little town, and we've been here for a long time, and we're going to be here. Um, uh, uh, you know, for, for a long time still to come, but we desperately need the constant support of the public. Uh, we also have a long-standing uh, work experience program. So if people out there um, want to work with reptiles, and there are lots of people that do this, um, they really struggle to get exposure and experience. So uh, you can contact the center directly and you can fit into our volunteer programs or work experience programs. You get everything that you need uh, through us. And that really helps people go on to uh, further their own careers in, uh, in reptile conservation. If they wanted to do that, you'd uh, go to your website, which is... Yes, so so um, our website is currently uh, under renovation. We're using our old website, which was kinyonga.net. Um, the new website, hoodspreadreptilecenter.com, is not live yet. Um, but you can reach us on email, uh, reptile at yebo.co.za, or simply just uh, track us down on Instagram and Facebook, send us a message, and we'll just respond with all of the relevant information that, you, uh, that somebody might need. Final question. Do you have a message to those watching about reptile conservation? Uh, yes. Um, guys, if you like reptiles and you like amphibians, uh, get out there, find your local conservation center and find out what they need uh, in, in order to uh, support them. Uh, otherwise, um, share social media content. Don't share rubbish on the internet. Share credible information. Help dispel the myths and uh, misconceptions out there about reptiles. And uh, importantly as well, if you do have a pet reptile, do your research. Make sure that you're caring for that animal properly and make sure that you're not supporting any entity that is uh, uh, taking animals out of the wild. You want to be sure that your animals are captive bred uh, because the reptile poaching uh, problem worldwide is horrendous and we, uh, we see a lot of this firsthand. Uh, so please don't support any entity where you feel may have been part of a smuggling or poaching syndicate. Uh, rather, make sure that the animals are, are captive bred. Cool. Chris, thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I hope that your center goes from strength to strength wish you all the very best for the future thank you very much happy to uh, be part of the interview